Christians in politics, why we need more. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. If you are a Christian, which I'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast, that you probably are. I don't think I get too many atheists listening to Bold and Blunt, which comes right out and says everything from a Christian conservative perspective. But if you are a Christian listening to this podcast, do you vote? Do you get involved in politics? In particular, do you go to your local school board meetings, your local boards of supervisor meetings, your local city council meetings? How about your zoning meetings, your planning and zoning commission meetings? I can tell you from covering the media on local levels for years and years and years that planning and zoning is just a cesspool of property rights seizures right? You get these activists, paid activists from the radical environmental crowd that actually go to these planning and zoning hearings on a regular basis. That's their job in life, right? They go there and they protest any sort of development in communities, in particular communities, in the elitist communities in America where, you know, the people come from, they get their money in oil, they get their money in big business, they get their money in Wall Street, and then they move to these remote areas, these remote country areas that are very picturesque, very scenic, very beautiful, but they don't want anyone else to move there. Once they've established their mansions and their properties and and so forth, they want to keep out the rest of the people. It's the ultimate nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. And so instead of doing it the American way, right? Instead of buying property, around themselves and holding that property and and keeping it from development, right? The free market way. They don't want to do that. So they, they send their minions into these local meetings and their minions stand up and protest, right? Ad nauseum non-stop developments that might impact their property. And when I say impact their property, I've covered some areas, right, where an impact to a property owner is deemed an annoyance if there's a, uh, a wire that's going to cross their scenic view. So when they look out their their kitchen window, they don't want to see any of those old ugly telephone wires, even if it's a half mile away, right? They don't want that. So they'll go and they'll protest and they'll keep out, uh, you know, telephone service or so forth from any area that touches up to any viewpoint that they can see from their kitchen window. And definitely things like electric plants or power plants, those things are no-goes. Those things are definite annoyances uh, to these people who move into these remote areas and then wanna keep out you and me. And forget schools, forget schools being built or businesses, those nasty Walmarts and Lowe's and Home Depot's big box retailers, right? Because those are too ugly, so ugly. And if you are a millionaire who has made money in the oil business or by corporations by buying up corporate stocks such as Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot uh, early on and making your money in it, then you have the right to demand that these same companies that you made your money in don't relocate or, or open businesses where you live because you, after all, are an elite and you don't need these people. You don't need these people in your community where you can see them in your kitchen window. So my point here is that if you're not covering these local local board meetings, and I think I digress just for a moment there, but if you're not covering these local meetings, then you're missing out on so much of the the seizures of liberties that take place. And so property rights is one one angle of that, right? Your your local zoning and planning commissions, they do quite a bit with dealing with the permitting process and so forth. And if you want to see how the UN's climate change alarmism filters into your backyard, and prevents you from building a shed in your backyard or repaving your driveway, 
then you need to attend these meetings and see how they cite studies from the UN, right? From the United Nations and the same reports that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez cries about in Congress that we only have 12 years left to live, 12 years, 12 years, and that 12 years never changes, but you're not supposed to notice that. But the same reports that she cites are the same reports that are cited by the leftists who serve in your local boards, right, that keep out development in your community. Planning and zoning is where it's happening for the anti-private property rights zealots. And also, if you go to your school boards, right, go to your school board meetings, this is where all the LGBTQ rights agenda gets pushed forward. And depending on how your board's a supervisor or your city council, whether you're a county or city in terms of local government, depending on their political makeup, this is where all the anti-Christian, anti-religious, anti-shows of uh, biblical values in your school system take place. This is where they change your school calendar from saying Christmas break to holiday break. This is where they change your school calendar from taking off uh, Washington's birthday to making it into a generic President's Day, right? This is where this stuff happens. So if you're a Christian and maybe you vote, okay, that's good. Maybe you don't vote. So I don't even know why you would have a voice in America, because if you're a Christian and don't vote, you have no right to speak out on the evils that are taking place because you can't even drag yourself to the polls and cast a ballot. You can't even spend a half hour due diligence researching candidates who might, might put forth a view that's actually good for America. If you're, if you're a Christian and don't vote, then you know what? Just turn this off right now because why even listen? You're not going to do anything with the information you get. So just, you know, turn on, turn on TV and go binge watch something. But if you're a Christian and, and you do vote, and you want to get more involved, I'm telling you right now, the local community is where you can make a massive difference. Everybody looks federal. Everybody looks at Congress. And yes, that's important. But these real rubber meets the road policies are taking place at the local level. If you don't understand why your kids are coming home and parroting the zero emissions bullcrap that's being pushed by the leftists and the bureaucrats and the globalists and the anti-American forces at the World Health Organization or the World Economic Forum or the United Nations, then you need to go to the local levels and see when they select their textbooks, right? Take a look through those textbooks textbooks. Those things are done at state levels first and then local levels. And yes, you have a voice. You have a voice in what books are adopted into your public school system. The reason you don't think you do is because nobody ever takes advantage of the power of their voice. And so when somebody does stand up and say something, these boards push back hard because they think, hey, you don't have a right to speak on this. Well, you do. Remember, you're the taxpayer in this country, right? The president of the United States works for you. He's your humble servant. That's how it's supposed to work in America. And so if the president of the United States is your hu humble servant, well, that pinhead at the board of supervisor who wants to shut down your three minutes of speaking time because he or she doesn't like what you're saying, he works for you. You know what you do. You remind him that he works for you. And when simple words don't work, this is how you follow up with action. You go FOIA everybody's salary who works for you in that county and then post it on a website. When I worked in local media, I did this regularly. When I went to a new town or a new county or new city or whatever to cover a new board, new police department, new school board, new board of uh, supervisors, one of the first things I did was I FOIA'd everybody's salary and then I wrote stories on it. But that's not a media thing. That's a right. In Virginia, anybody anybody can FOIA the salaries of people, right? And nothing says you work for me like mentioning publicly how much you pay that person, 
right? If you want to humble a superintendent who won't give you the time of day and discuss a transgender policy that you don't want in the public school system that you already pay for, if you want to remind that superintendent who works for whom here, start talking about the $262,000 that you pay him or her each year right? And then start talking about in the superintendent's contract, how many cushy benefits he or she gets, such as $260,000 base salary a year, but also free internet and free gas and 15 days of tax paid travel for ridiculous conferences across the nation that he or she has no really business right attending in the first place. Start talking about all that, FOIA the superintendent's contract, because that is not a private document, okay? That is something that you, as a citizen, not just a member of the media like I've done, it, that's something that you have the right to see. So when the arrogance and pride of local government officials starts really driving you nuts, one of the first action steps you can take is to FOIA the salaries. And here's another quick note. FOIA does not have to be written, okay? Your school boards and your county officials and your clerks, right? They all want you to fill out a FOIA form and explain the reasons why you want this info. And they want a record. They want a record of who you are and they want to file that, right? They want to keep that on file so they can identify the troublemakers and so forth. FOIA is not required to be written. You can speak FOIA. You can just say, I would... I request the records, I request the salaries of every county official who makes more than $12,000 per year, along with their names, their titles, and their, their work status, whether they're full or part-time. You can simply say that, and you can get those records. That's state law, okay? Now, I've always put it in writing in an email. I don't play their silly form games, right? Those forms, they can fill them out themselves. But I always put it in an email so I have a record of the request because they have to respond to your request within five business days. So if you, if you ask for the records on a Thursday, Saturday, Sunday doesn't count, right? You, you, you start the timeline on the Thursday, and they have to respond. And they, if they deny records, they have to put in writing, right, why they are denying it. This is Virginia. Every other state out there has some sort of FOIA law, sunshine law. You can look it up uh, in your own state codes and so forth. But I'm only telling you this information because if you are a Christian, right, and you vote and you want to take the next step and do more get more involved in politics in America, which is what we need in this country. More Christians, more unafraid Christians who understand the history of this country was the quest for religious liberty. And Christianity is in our DNA. It was Judeo-Christian principles that brought this country to such, such exceptionalism. And it'll be Judeo-Christian principles that bring this nation back to exceptionalism. So I tell you all this, if you're a Christian and you vote and you want to get more involved, start attending some of your local meetings. I know you probably can't take off work to go do this, but a lot of this stuff is online and you can, you can do it after, right? You can do it at night after. It's not, the, it's not the most exciting way to spend an evening, granted. I've had to spend many, many, many evenings going to meetings in my life to cover them for the paper. And some of those meetings are pretty dry, right? But you can fast forward. You can fast forward when they start, you know, patting themselves on the back, which they do. I, I, heads up. They like to give themselves pats on the back, these local boards. And they like to give themselves awards and so forth. And you can just fast forward over that. Get to the part where they deal with local issues, local, uh, you know, local petitions, local, local policies and so forth. And listen into it and then take action, right? You can send a quick email. You can make a quick phone call. 
He might even be able to do some quick texting. I don't know. But Christians need to get more involved, more involved in politics. And there's nothing that makes a mark like getting involved in local politics. And I have a guest today. I have a guest today who is a Christian who has written a book about Jesus and politics. And so if you're a little bit hesitant on whether, geez, is it the Christian thing to do to get involved in politics? My guest has a lot to say on that. Bunny Pounds, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. It is so great to have you here. Oh, it's great to be with you, Cheryl, anytime. I am really excited about your book coming out in 2024 that you're taking pre-orders for right now, as I understand it. But Jesus and Politics is the title. And I wanted to ask you just bluntly, was Jesus political? Well, he got involved in all parts of culture. You know, he said to his disciples, give to Caesar what Caesars do. Um, He interacted with all the religious leaders of his time, all of the city leaders at the gate, um, the tax collector, Matthew. Um, He didn't step away from culture. He engaged with culture. So why do we have so many Christians these days reluctant to get involved, at least publicly, openly, with politics? I think we still have something in our back of our mind that there are certain things that are sacred like church attendance, Sunday school, and certain things that are secular. And we don't really see that God wants to invade all parts of our life. And part of my story is that I am i was just a homeschooling mom that got active and really uh, went deep with God to know his word and to stay in prayer and to really impact the people around me. And, and that's what he's calling us to do is to disciple and to love the people around us. And for me, that's just been with politicians and government officials. So what did that look like? Talk, talk a little bit more about uh, drawing closer to God. Was that s- sort of a years long journey or was that uh, just for a few months? H- how did that work for you? for me. I had an encounter with the Lord when I was 13 and really got a hunger for the Bible. I've loved to study the Bible since I was a young girl. Uh, I was one of those people in high school that, you know, had the Bible club and the prayer meeting in the middle of the cafeteria um, with other Christian students. But I thought I was going to be a missionary to Latin America, and I end up running a pest control company with my husband <laughs> and having little kids. And I'm like, why am I stuck in America? In my, in my mind, I felt like I was a little bit stuck in this country until I realized that God wanted to use my life wherever I was here in my own hometown uh, in Texas. And so that led me into really starting to advocate for um, the sanctity of human life, for Israel, different uh, issues that I cared about. And then that led to me going back to college and then becoming a congressman campaign manager and and a thousand other things I've done in my life since that point. Can you give any details about what you said when you were 13, you had an encounter with God? Yeah, I heard the gospel. Um, that God loved me and that he wanted to redeem my soul and that I couldn't uh, find salvation apart from him. And uh, and it hit me. I was a pastor's kid, but yet I think I really didn't have a relationship with the Lord in a personal way. Um, and so that changed my life. And so my whole life has been um, wanting to make a difference in my, my world, but also to lead people into relationship with him in a greater way. Um, I got to walk beside my former um, boss, uh, Congressman Jeb Henserling, who became financial services chairman in the House. Um, I had lots of other clients like Congressman Lee Zeldin, Congressman Sean Duffy in Wisconsin. Um, I was the only person endorsed by Vice President Mike Pence in the 2018 primary because I had had encounters with him where I prayed over him and brought him the word of God and We've built a friendship over a decade. And so I think we underestimate the power of what God can do through one individual's life. And I hope that my story kind of inspires people that they can live for God wholeheartedly and then impact the people around them. And and what you say about having a relationship with God, that's really what 
it's all about in terms of bringing the relationship with God and godly virtues and principles into politics. It's not about preaching as a member of the political class, right? It's just about your relationship and how that shines through. Correct. We all have highs and we all have lows. And in politics and government, we have those. We win races, we lose races. We have people um, that we walk with whether as a staffer or an activist um, that, you know, doesn't fulfill what they were supposed to do or or bills don't get passed the way we want. But it's how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that in our own soul? And part of the motivation for this book is to teach people that even as we're engaging in politics and government, um, that we can watch our souls, we can watch our hearts, we can push off the things of pride and anger and fear and offenses and bitterness that sometimes try to take us out in politics as Christians. Um, But to really give people an example that we can fight back against those and be obedient to the Lord, to love people, even in the midst of sometimes suffering and persecution and disappointment. So we all have to deal with things, um, but the Lord walking us through those is really the answer. It's funny you just talk about fighting, uh, and people who read the Bible understand that, yes, God is about love, but he's also about truth and accountability and law and, and so forth and so on. And I think part of the problem with this generation we now have in America is they think love is love, and that means you must tolerate everything. So with that and with your background, How do you think Jesus would react to, and we're speaking of politics here, the Democrat Party and the platforms that they advocate? Well, I think he would go to them with truth and say, you know, friends, let's go back to Genesis 1 that I created male and female. (laughs) Um, You know, there's very clear truth in the Word of God that we can't get away from. And so when we start moving away from those principles, those absolute truths, those, that moral clarity, um, our lives become muddled. And I think Jesus reaches out with compassion and tries to have a conversation with people because ultimately he wants to protect their hearts and their souls. He wants them to prosper in their life. He wants them to be healthy internally. You know, he, he is so grieved, I believe by all these young people that are dealing with mental illness and insecurities and rejection and all the things that the culture has brought upon them. So Jesus is trying to bring truth to people for the purpose of their own life, and it's out of his love that he brings truth. In your book, Due Out in 2024, Jesus and Politics, is it more a story of your personal experiences or is it research-based um, analysis or a combination of both? How, describe, describe how you wrote your book, um, what kind of tone and tenor it is. Yeah, well, I believe Jesus had the most impact when he told in parables and stories. So I'm trying to inspire two groups of people those that are already involved in government and politics at some level to walk with Jesus in that process, to carry his presence into rooms and the meetings and to really think about discipling the nation one heart at a time. Um, and I do that through a lots of crazy stories from my own life, um, my race for Congress, walking beside members of Congress for years, even uh, the genesis of our nonprofit Christians Engaged. Um, but I also am trying to lead people and Americans into that aren't engaged to start thinking, you know what, I can get involved in my local community with my school board, with my county government, and I can get to know my member of Congress and have their cell phone number and pray for them and advocate for my beliefs as well in a loving uh, and godly tone. And so it's kind of my way of mentoring people through stories. Every chapter, there's 10 chapters has a, um, something I want them to know about God and how to walk with God. Um, but then I kind of drive that home really with these crazy stories of politics and government. It's, it's a fun read. 
How do you deal with the trend nowadays, which has has reared itself at different points in history, but the trend nowadays for many churches to say that if Jesus were walking the earth today, he would be a socialist. And it's that social justice type of gospel teaching that they put forth in their churches. Well, we actually, through our ministry, Christians Engage, um, on November 15, just released a a, um, whole class called Biblical Economics, where we go through the Bible um, on personal responsibility, entrepreneurship. We start with, uh, we start with the Proverbs 31 woman, that she made goods, she sold goods, she took care of her family, um, and go through the things that we, I, from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and Jesus' is teaching, that the Bible is not t- advocating for socialism. The early church does not advocate for socialism. Um, the Bible is advocating for the church to be the answer in our world to every ill in our country. Government's not the answer. You can't find that in the scriptures. Um, but it's a, it's a lot deeper uh, study, Cheryl, I could, than I could tell you on this podcast, but just know we've got resources to help people really study that out and, and to get back to the truth. And let's, yeah. let, let's talk about your organization, Christians Engage, because I did want to touch on that. Um, when, are you the founder of that, or are you the young? Uh, I am. Okay. Yeah, I, I founded the organization the beginning of 2020. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know COVID was about to hit. Um, but we've grown from just the state of Texas to now all 50 states. We have built the only 501c3 voter mobilization communication system for people of faith in all 50 states, where people can go to our website at christiansengage.org, and they take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. They say, I will commit to pray for five minutes a week for my nation. I will commit to vote in every election and I will start engaging in some form of civic education or involvement for the well-being of America. And when they do that, we send everybody a prayer with a video, with a scripture every Monday, so we stop and think to pray for our president, our Congress, our mayors. We send voting reminders, four texts and four emails with a simple Christian nonpartisan voting uh, roadmap for that election, whether it's the primary, local election, special elections, or national elections. Um, And then we also have lots of free resources, a weekly show, articles, teaching people how to engage. But um, our on-ramp to civic engagement seminar and our civics and biblical worldview classes are really impacting people's hearts and lives as we teach them civics and Bible um, and teach them how to get involved. It's really fun. And, and let's just finish uh, with this, Bonnie. I, I don't know if you went into this in your book, Jesus in Politics, but I'm sure at Christians Engaged, your nonprofit organization, you deal with it all the time. What kind of engagement are we seeing in the Christian community, however you want to qualify that? I'm thinking maybe the last 10 years, um, the trend over the last 10 years and looking forward. In terms of the numbers or percentages of Christian voters, what are you finding? Well, what we found in 2020 that was not as large of an engagement as we saw in 2016, um, but in 2020, really, it was about 2% of American Christians that identified themselves as born-again Christians voted more than the general public. Um, We're really not doing a very good job of getting out of apathy. you know, some people are being awakened. I call it the remnant of people are being awakened that we can't sit back on the sidelines any longer. But when you think of half the population still really not being registered to vote, conservative, um, Bible-believing Christians are not engaging. And a lot of it is we are afraid to make mistakes. We think we're going to make a mistake. We don't know enough information. Um, we don't know when the elections are. So we help all of that. We answer all those questions that Christians engage and help people um, that are being awakened right now to step out and make those decisions that they're going to attempt to vote in every election and spend 20 minutes researching their ballot and get it done. Yeah, the Christian community should be 100% voting. I mean, that's why we're facing the troubles we're facing right now. 
because the Christian community hasn't gone political enough, in my view, anyhow. And we, we have to think of it as a biblical thing. Um, can we love our neighbors well by electing righteous people? Um, Proverbs 29 says, you know, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. There's a direct reaction um, between having righteous leaders or people that are seeking God in places of authority versus people that are, quote, wicked, that don't have a biblical worldview and are really out for greed, their own self-interest. Um, they're not serving the will of the people. So we can discern our ballot. If we, I, I like to encourage Christians, turn off Netflix for 30 minutes and research your ballot um, with our guide every election. And if they do that, they will go in 98% more informed than anybody else. And we can make uh, great decisions um, of how to really put in people. You know, they're not going to be perfect. They're imperfect people. But, you know, put in people that can run our city, state, and nation better yep. than what we're seeing. Perfect message. Thank you. Bunny Pounds, your new book, Jesus in Politics. You're taking pre-orders, I assume, Amazon, anywhere else? Yes, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, ChristianBook.com. Go ahead and pre-order it. It comes out February 6th. And uh, share it with your friends. It's going to be really impactful, I believe, for the next generation. Excellent. I agree. All right. Well, Bunny, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. It was great to chat with you. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Really appreciate your work. Bunny Pounds, Jesus in Politics. The full title actually is Jesus in Politics. One Woman's Walk with God in a Mud-Slinging Profession. Check it out. Buy a copy. I want to thank you if you subscribe to Bold and Blunt. Thank you very much for subscribing. I really appreciate it. And if you're not a subscriber, please check it out. Go to WashingtonTimes.com. Find the newsletter section. Click on it. Find my newsletter. It is Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. Sign up. All you have to do is put in your email address and you will get in your email box Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Delivered right to you the commentaries that I write at the Washington Times as well as my twice weekly Bold and Blunt podcast, which you may also get at edify.app at Real Life Network and anywhere podcasts are offered. Thank you so much for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, don't forget... Stay blunt. Stay bold. Marketing is hard. But I'll tell you a little secret. It doesn't have to be. Let me point something out. You're listening to a podcast right now, and it's great. You love the host. You seek it out and download it. You listen to it while driving, working out, cooking, even going to the bathroom. Podcasts are a pretty close companion. And this is a podcast ad. Did I get your attention? You can reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Libsyn Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements or run a pre-produced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience in their favorite podcasts with Libsyn Ads. Go to LibsynAds.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N, ads.com today.